You ask me, I ask. I love it. And we're back. Okay. And, that's and we're back. It feels no, it feels I mean, like it's been a, a little while. Feels like a but it really not it really hasn't. It does. It does. It does. You know what? I, yeah, I need I'm like really looking forward to catching up and hearing what's new in your life. I've got some updates Boy. too. I feel like our personal <laughs> no check in pressure. time today, we're gonna raise the bar on ourselves. <laughs> No pressure. Well, I'll just say for myself, I have something interesting. And because yeah. uh, the pandemic has just kind of been one long day, you know, like it's just been 14 <laughs> months of just just breathing. Um, so I've, I've, I've got an wait, anomaly in mind. But I'm going I'm, I'm to wait. I'm going I'm to make our audience okay. sit back and be I'll patient. Take, I'll yeah. do the warm up back to your big. Yeah, your I'm going uh, to tease it out and, the, and then make them wait. No. Uh, oh, that no. makes me sound like it's a huge narcissist right there. It's like, That's okay. it's like no, no. <laughs> Your life is usually it's so much more eventful. It feels like so. That's why I'm like, hey, I think I can kind of finally compete with Jess a little bit. We got we we're like we both have stuff going on. Latest, greatest. Tell us, tell us um, friend. Okay, what, what is so I the last time we first talked? of all so many things. I think um, I've been outside a lot and I've been seeing people in person, having like having a beer with folks, just. Uh, Isn't it amazing? Downtown. I said, let's grab ice cream to somebody the other day. I mean, it was just like, I haven't said those things in real life and, and meant it in a, <laughs> in a long time. Since 2019, definitely ice cream. Long time. I know. You and I got I together. Know, you and I got to meet together and hang out we for the sat first across time. The table from and we one almost another forgot. And we almost forgot we were meeting in person. Remember that? Meeting in and out. It was fantastic. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. It is bringing me back to life. So I'm happy there. Um, our listeners may hear uh, me talking. I, I was saying to Rob earlier that I have to do this check-in because I have a little bit of a lisp now when I talk because I've, I've now week five into Invisalign. And I'm straightening these lower teeth. They're, they're looking a little T-Rex-ish. So I had to get those straightened out. Um, and, yeah, and it's not easy, but... Um, the one kind of fun thing that's is the a, list. That's a I sort of liked it. I like it. I like it. it's kind of cute. So, <laughs> so that's that. And then um, by the time that this airs, more than likely will be the week of, because it's in two weeks, the week of or the week after, my son will be successfully moved in at Florida Atlantic. So, mm -hmm. Lots going on. Whoa. Oh, really good stuff. Big really move. excited. I'm sitting in Raleigh recording this. You know, we kind of are mobile still, and I'm. Uh, it's gorgeous. I'm right outside on the road, so I'm going to be muting on and off just because our listeners need to know all the details of our lives, don't they, Rob? <laughs> How we move around. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. You give them the full, yeah. full immersive experience. Yeah. That's what so they signed that up for. So on that very that's what they note for. of where give the people what they want. actually located and in what city and all of the all of that, let's kick it over to you so you can set the tone with your big COVID update. I may have hyped no, this I'm up excited. too much. I yeah, really am. It's is, been this, so long. I, I should have been a more subtle, but update. that's really, just not. I can't wait to hear. It's not. I'm not good at it. So, so you're gonna, you're gonna, you're probably. I don't know how what your what your reaction is gonna be to this. I have, I have no idea. But uh, we finally, <gasps> we broke down. I that finally broke down news. and said yes really? to a dog. So we got a puppy. Yes. I was the one, I don't think we ever talked about no. this, but I was the one in my family. Every, there's always one. There's always one person that's like, N I, I don't know if that's a good idea. And I was like, man, we need to wait till, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. We need to wait to till it, yeah. but maybe yeah. until maybe our youngest was out of diapers, something. Yeah, but I did. I couldn't make it to whatever goal I had for myself. And it's one of those things, I feel like cars or there's a lot of things in life where like, when you start browsing or talking about it, it can happen really mm -hmm. fast. And that's what happened for us with the dog. It felt mm -hmm. like I broke down and like 48 hours later, there was an animal in our house. So now we have a little 12 awesome. week old puppy chewing on stuff. And so everybody that's doing listening, all the, like, doing Jeff, all the things, uh, you all know, the questions. So this is my job. So what kind of dog did you get? Is it a rescue? Is it a, all the things? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Important details. 
we we got a we got a we bought it from a, a I guess a farm oh. like a place that, that you know breeds dogs. It's a foxhound, which is kind of cool for those of you that are maybe on the upper end of the millennial, uh, early end of the Gen Xers. You know that movie, that cartoon, that Disney movie, uh, the Fox and the Hound. I don't know. I mean, it's kind it's kind of a sad movie. I don't know if I'd recommend it, but that's how I knew. That's the only way I knew of what a foxhound was. I just knew I always liked black and brown dogs, and it's it's a cute it's one with the really long, big old ears, the old droopy ears. Uh, so he's he's a cutie. We named him Shep. Uh, Shep. Yeah. So that's a, that's a fun little uh, that, that's the name like we hear Napoleon being Thomas. yelled around our Did house name him about Shep hundred times so a day now. So that he could channel mm -hmm. his inner uh, shepherd. Yeah. Maybe we actually always liked that name for a kid. Uh, and but because our last name yeah. starts with SH, we thought that would just be too alliter alliter alliterative. See, I can't even say the word. <laughs> so we uh, we said, hey, we're not going to use this name. Uh, let's let's use it on a dog because he doesn't need to go story. by his last name. I love it. So there it is. Yeah, I only regret it oh about goodness. ninety percent. You know what? He's right totally now. sold because though. So uh, when I had Roscoe, at puppies that age, are a lot of work. I regretted every second of the day. I didn't know. Any and then when Tilly was sleeping, and then the sleep is, and that's probably the 10% yeah, you enjoy is when Shep is asleep and he's so cute and all this stuff, but it's fine. Yeah. I know it's going to be good. Our kids love it. I did it for the kids. I didn't do it because it makes my life easier. I did it because I knew it, it would bring a lot of joy to our kids. And that's, that's, that's what's all happening. That matters. So yeah, overall, you've got lots of points I feel like it was a, a good time. dad move. I hope you have your so list of gonna, chores set up for these go. kids to do. Because all you got to do is just be like, don't forget about Shep. You see Shep? I'm working on it. <laughs> they're already they're 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 their discipline is already starting that. to fade. But and I'm excited about today. And I'm excited, anyway. really excited about our guests. Our bio yep, is amazing. A lot of, so I'm really I am too. I am too. I'm I'm thrilled for this. I've I've our guest today, I think this conversation is is one that is gonna be I think long overdue for us because this is this is a part of what I think is so critical in conversations around justice that we haven't really leaned into the way that we're going to do today. And so I'm, I, th I think it's going to be a privilege and honor. We're excited. Uh, let me go ahead and welcome our guests on and find out whether they're an animal lover um, or they're like me. Uh, Sonia, Sonia Hi. Wang, are you here? Can, can you hear us? Hi, Sonia. We're glad Hello. you're here, friend. Hello, I am. Thanks, everyone, for having hey. me. Is we're gonna go ahead Thank and just you. turn the mic over to you. Is there anything that you want to respond to directly? Do you have any strong opinions on Invisalign puppies? We, we've given you being outdoors. There's so much to be able to engage with right now. What are all your thoughts? Well, I think it takes. First of all, I want to commend you, Jess, because it takes bravery to to broach Invisalign in our adult years. And I've been um, alongside yeah. my friend with that journey during the pandemic and yeah. it takes discipline Thank you. it's, it's Thank not you. it's not it for is, the weary it is so, a little tough yeah um, every week you I have feel to you. change out the so trays with people who know yeah. you and yeah. your mouth is constantly sore yeah yeah I you figure that. out what you know your snacks Thank you. to Thank eat you not to eat you taking so it in leaving it out like that. all of that <laughs> yeah so uh <laughs> I do, I do, I do. I, I, yes, I affirm you in that choice, and I commend you, and um, and congrats on the dog. Yeah, so I um, I love dogs. I love I love animals, but I'm allergic to cats. So um, you know that doesn't fare well um, at, at the house. But um, dogs are a lot of responsibility. They are. I'm not going to say it's, so, it's more brave. <laughs> than getting a Invisalign. I'm just going to hint that's what it is. Hilarious. That's all. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> but you know, but, but we all make our choices. And so in our choices, there's responsibility mm -hmm. and there's bravery that we kind of um, embrace. And so good on you, Ralph, for embracing that and being brave and it. getting a I puppy. It. I feel like I'm acting like a puppy right now where I'm like, hey, give, <laughs> me, you, give me the attention. Yeah. Can you tell it's the so puppy's brilliant. rubbing off of me, Jess? Or is this... Don't answer that question. I don't want you. I don't want to know whether that's how I always am or not. So we're just gonna we're just gonna move on. Oh, uh, yeah, keep moving. She's giving me like the hey. Uh, uh, 
we're we're starting to air these videos now, so Jess and I, all of our subtle cues that we usually give to each other, they're going to be publicized. So we're going to have to find another. We're going to have to like be texting offline <laughs> as the only way that we can safely communicate with each other. So Sonia, we're so excited to have you on today. Um, I'm going to give. I'm going to read off your, your your bio for those of you who don't know. There's actually a little bit of throwback callback to uh, a previous episode, which is pretty neat. Um, but Sonia is the founding member of New Covenant. New Community Covenant Church. So, some of you may recognize that church name from one of our previous guests, David Swanson, who was on, who, is, who serves as the lead pastor. Uh, so, she has served on the leadership team there as a chairperson and serves as many different ways, uh, more recently as a community group leader. Uh, and while Gandhi's call to be the change has been with her uh, on her journey as an educator, more recently, Sonia draws from James Baldwin's important reminder that the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change the world. Uh, which I think is a really powerful setup for today's conversation. And so she also serves as the executive director of New Community Outreach, which is a community-based nonprofit organization committed to the healing, reconciliation, and building up of Chicago's greater Bronzeville youth and community through restorative justice. We love that term around here. We talk about it all the time. Excited to have you expand on it. Uh, so in her work, Sonia works collaboratively with residents and organizations of the South Side of Chicago to mitigate the impact and reduce the causes of physical and emotional trauma and raise the opportunities for community equity and individual flourishing. Um, they envision a more just society where young people and communities have increased access to the tools and resources to heal from individual and community trauma, as well as increased opportunity to pursue work, growth, right there. development, justice, and equity. Okay. There's there's a lot of good work <laughs> happening, and uh, we're really we're really excited to lean into this. You know, I think knowing mm -hmm. having that conversation with David, which was really really impactful for those of you who has who have not heard that episode, I'd encourage everybody to go back and listen. So this is going to be very much a parallel conversation, right? So that episode was around kind of justice and the white church and the way that David, you know, your pastor is leaning in in really unique ways to lead out in that conversation locally in Chicago and even nationally. Um, but I think that's how I found out about your work, which is really was inspiring, made me lean in. I started doing my homework. I became an instant fan. Sonia, you know, I, e I emailed you like instantly right after that conversation. I was like, I've got to know more. And so we, we hopped on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a privilege to hear some of your story. And I, I, I didn't want to keep that to myself. I knew our listeners could really benefit from hearing more about you, what drives you in your work, and the important role of addressing trauma when you talk about pairing that with, with just, justice work. And so we're going to turn the microphone over to you and just maybe just lead off, Sonia, for our listeners and tell us there's so much more than what we just read. It kind of highlight and amplify a little bit more of your story and what led you to the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, well, first and foremost, I just, anytime I kind of enter into a space, I just want to appreciate you all for inviting me, allowing me to be in this space with you. Um, I recognize that I'm coming into your space, and so I have a lot of gratitude for that, and so just want to kind of put out the appreciation first and foremost. Um, and so, again, thank you so much for even um, asking about my story. I think stories are so important as part of the work that I get to do. Um, so my path um, really is grounded in the work of education, and so um, I was um, a teacher, a middle school teacher, uh, for some time on the south side of Chicago in the neighborhoods of West Englewood and the Woodlawn, um, and then I had the opportunity to step into some leadership positions and uh, was an administrator, um, including a principal at a middle school <clears throat> for about seven um, years. Um, before feeling the call to take some time off. Um, and um, in that very intentional sabbatical. Um, so I, I worked on the South Side of Chicago, and one of the, let me just talk about that really briefly, because that really um, marks a lot of where I am now and the work that I get to do right now. Um, I taught English, I got to lead a middle school, um, and our, our young people were just continuously just phenomenal phenomenal people, right? People with um, remarkable stories, remarkable capacity. Um, and 
what we continue to hope for is how do we get opportunities to really allow them to flourish in ways that um, just aren't always afforded, right? Um, and the reality is that resources are uh, distributed differently, right? Um, and I, I, I felt that as a principal um, in a way that differently from the way I felt that as a teacher. Um, and, and what does it look like to really be intentional and thoughtful about making sure that um, as educators, we're allowing for windows and mirrors, right? So how do we allow our young people to see themselves in their learning and growth process, right? And how do we allow our young people to see beyond what they are immediately within, right? And I think that's kind of, as a youth worker, whatever kind of space you're in, I think that's a really important charge that we have. Um, restorative justice um, is kind of always been, a, it started becoming this like buzz phrase, right? Around like, ooh, this is the way to go about mending relationships. Um, it, and it became kind of a tool for conflict mediation, conflict resolution, all that. And it, it sounded, yeah, really important and really great. Um, so then fast forward to kind of having this time off, um, I, my faith played a big role in going into education, I also played a big role in taking that time off. And um, I didn't anticipate going back to work um, until later on. So um, that sabbatical came in um, the summer of 2019. and so. COVID happened while I was on my sabbatical, and an opportunity came up um, with New Community Outreach, which is the nonprofit that was kind of born out of the Ministry of New Community Covenant Church, um, where Pastor Swanson, um, you know, is, is pastor and resides there. Um, and it's an organization that's really grounded and rooted in the community, and is really about what does it mean to think about um, and I'm just going to use RJ for short when I talk about story of justice. Um, and, you know, when things just kind of doors open and you things kind of click, um, that's kind of how I came into this position. And it, in the past year, a little over a year that I've been in this position leading NCO, New Community Outreach, what I've had the opportunity to do is understand what restorative justice looks like, not in the sense in a much broader sense, in the sense of what does it mean to develop an ecosystem or approach restorative justice as a lifestyle um, and really seep into human interactions and engagement that then allows for a much more um, robust and um, just a nourishing way of living, right? Which is a little different from the way in which we approached RJ in a school space um, when I was, from my experience. Right, and, and, and if I were to be back in a school, you know, and down the road, the way I would want to bring RJ into that school context would look remarkably different because of my learning experience in this role, the people that I have had the privilege to engage with, to learn from, um, and to serve. And so, um, I love that. That's a great, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a little bit just in terms of how, how I'm here. This gap that I think we found ourselves in uh, for the Just podcast, it's, it's sort of this like, I didn't even realize it when Rob introduced your work, Sonia, when he sent me an email about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, we haven't talked about this intersectionality around young people, um, what they may have been facing, what they face in general, but then through COVID, the trauma through COVID, this idea of justice and how to, that intersectionality. So um, Rob reminds me that we're getting close to 50, our, our 50th uh, episode, which is a great milestone for us. Um, we're getting old. We're, we're seasoned, sir. We're seasoned. We're getting old. We're getting that's old. all. Um, awesome. but, but, but that's awesome because the, the focus that we had from the very beginning when we, when we developed this on a whiteboard was that we would, we would center this podcast around this idea of justice, hence the name, and, and those, that type of thing. But as you, as we think about it, um, we haven't really that we haven't dug deep into the work that you do, Sonia. So I'm really want our users, our the users, our listeners to think about this and and really learn from you today. So let's mm. let's talk about this. We just find ourselves on the other side, I guess we can say that now with some kind of certainty. What that's sort of the other side of COVID. It has been a traumatic year, right? Um, been especially traumatic, I think, for our youth. I'm constantly concerned mm. about our communities and our young people mm -hmm. how to navigate this with families and neighbors. Um, but so tell us, you know, help our listeners understand 
that intersectionality in general, and specifically the young people that you find yourself serving day to day? Yeah, so I, I think um, I think it's important to for me to share when I when I talk about trauma and when I talk about justice, right? What those words mean, because oftentimes hmm. you know words become kind of thrown around. And so when when I when we talk about trauma at NCO, we recognize that um, there are distressing and disturbing experiences that uh, people have endured, right? Um, and some of that, uh, you know. It's, it's out of our control almost always, right? And our response to that distressing or disturbing experience um, is trauma, right? And, and trauma can, I think it's really important to identify that trauma um, is in the form of, it's a physical form, it can mm. be emotional, it's mind, body, and soul, spiritual. Like, um, it's, it's really important that we don't relegate it just to um, our mind. Right, this emotional mm. element. It's not just a mental health issue. You know, there are neurological things. There are, you know, physical, muscular responses. All of that we have to recognize. Right. So then, I'm going to pause to kind of put that to a shelf and think about what justice is. Um, and to us, when we when we think about um, the pursuit of justice, right, we think about systems and structures, right, that are set up where um, all people are provided with opportunities to flourish, right? And so I'm going to be bold here and, and, I'm, and go and say there, the whole like notion of, you know, there's a lot of talk about equality and equity and stuff like if there's true justice, right, that whole conversation and debate around equity and equality really should dissipate, right? Because what we see is kind of a piece that comes with true justice, right? Now, if we bring those two together, when there's traumatic experiences, when we experience trauma, right, and there are, when there's no justice, you begin to see how those two, um, I don't want to say concepts, because these are lived experiences, right? How those lived experiences intersect, right? right? When we have not been treating people with the same sort of this basic human rights, right? It's inevitable that there's going to be distress, that things are going to be disturbing. When we're not afforded certain things, right, because of inequity, right? When we, when my, when students can't travel from one A to B, and it's not even like a full mile or two miles, there's something distressing about that, whether there was a specific incident or not. Right to to have that understanding becomes traumatic, right? But on top of that, and to, and to bring it to kind of the realities of what we've experienced the past year, you know, I mean, we we read about it. We some of us have firsthand experience just the ways in which COVID nineteen, that pandemic, the pandemic of racism, right? The pandemic of gun violence. Um, I mean, with students being at home, young people, we've, we've heard about the increased incidence of abuse. Like, there's a lot of just confound, you know, compounded ways that our, our students, our young people hmm. have hmm. experienced this past year, right? And that we have to, have to recognize and have to think about what does it then mean to, to support, to be alongside, to provide safe spaces. Um, so that in the midst of that, in the midst of our lived reality, we still empower, mm. we heal, and mm. we are able to move That's good. forward. Hey, Sonia, I'm picking up a little bit of background noise. We can edit this part out. Is there, it might be, can you try not hopping off your iPod, okay. AirPods and maybe just speaking directly? In the, it, may, it may actually mitigate it if you change up how you're, you want to try that for a second? If not, we can, we can oh, make the best okay. of what we're hearing now, but I want to make sure people are hearing you as clearly as possible. Okay. Yeah, see if you can just, so hear, if you're in a place where it's okay off. and you can just kind of talk directly to the computer, let's try that and see if that might actually help increase the quality. Oh. 
Yeah. Oh, you may have lost her. Yes, popping. I heard the pop. Sound like she was in an airplane hangar a little bit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th and I think we can make the best of it, but I I want to push for better if we can. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's that actually is, is is better. Jess, does that sound cleaner on your end? Yeah, popping is gone. Okay, if you're if you're okay to continue this way, Sonia, I think this will be better. It'll be a higher quality for people to hear you if you can hear us. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that should be fine. Perfect. Um, so we'll just we'll just cut that middle part out. Obviously, that's one of the joys of being able to have an editor on the back. I think that's what uh, she's. She, are you in a space where now everybody so Sonia, can hear us, Sonia? Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I'm still fine. Him. I think he's fine. He's fine. Comes an issue, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> okay, yeah. Feel free. And if you need to hop on mute while we're talking and you're, you know, you, you can feel free to do that to minimize hmm. things. Or if we need to even give you a press pause to move locations, we're flexible. We can do whatever we need to. We're good. You good to go? Okay. So, Sonia, on that note, I think. Yeah, we can oh, hear you. I think I'm hearing can you me, hear me now echoing. You're. That's the Oh, okay. Yeah, you definitely Neither of you are echoing from me. Yeah, I can hear myself coming through, which I think might be a problem on the back end. Uh, maybe go back out and just see. Now I feel like I can hear me talking. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I think that's probably going to be what it is. If she's if oh, well, creating, we just that, maybe creating need that to be loop on effect. Like, I need not, to be on mute. We can go back to the. Yeah, is that better? I just muted my. Yeah, we can we can do it that way where everybody just kind of if you're not talking, you just hop on mute. Let's just do it that way. And that way it'll be everybody's highest quality. And then. If you're hearing something, that's echoey, good. just check your mute status. Sound good. OK, cool. All right, I'm going to. I'm going to, we're going to come back in hot. Here we go. So Sonia, I'd love for you to unpack a little bit your, the day to day of what this looks like on a, pra on a practical level for our listeners, right? Because these are, these are huge issues and, and very layered concepts that you're laying out, right? Not only, I mean, we, we've been trying our best for the last two years to unpack the term restorative justice for people. You're introducing not only a new term in like, what does it look like to, Come alongside people who've experienced trauma, of which that 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 group is so much larger, you know, today or compounded today than it was, you know, this time last year. Uh, you're working with young people who are experiencing, or maybe are victims of injustice and trauma, and you know that that really painful combination. What is that when you show up to work every day? Kind of walk us through a day in the life of what does that look like? Because I think it's important for our listeners. You know, for us to hear these words, it, it come, sometimes can feel paralyzing of, oh, oh, like this is complicated. I'm just going to kind of throw my hands up and be like, I don't know. But that's not what you've done. You haven't done that. You've actually rolled up your sleeves and leaned in to come alongside young people in your community in ways that are really having an impact. And so just give us a little bit of a sneak peek, a, a day in the life of what it looks like to do the work that you're doing through New Community Outreach. Yeah, so... I think what I want to talk about, rather than going into like, oh, here are our programs, here are the events, I, it's not about that. I mean, those things are important, and I'm really proud and excited about the work we get to do. I really think it's about mindset and posture, right? And so to me, um, so trauma-informed care, which is kind of a, a term that's that's been out there, and I think it's important, but I don't think it can live without a very intentional um, emphasis on healing-centered work, right? They, they have to go hand in, because if we just think about trauma-formed care, what are we focusing on? We're focusing on those distressed and disturbed incidents, and that is not who our young people are. It doesn't make who they are. Here's who, what makes who they are. Their, their laughter, their talents, the, their quirks, their love for K-pop, their, you know, their their love for like fashion or or um, working at a nursing home and wanting to serve the elderly, like that's what is what marks the strength, resilience, and the beauty of our youth. 
And so when we talk about trauma-informed care, I have to have to remind myself, it's about it's about the person, right? And so it's about it's about how do I cultivate, curate, create restorative spaces for that healing-centered work, right? Some of that is about relationship building. I mean, a lot of it is actually, <laughs> you know, it's about being seen, seeing, knowing, right? And, and being willing to, to go that extra step, right? Even when I'm feeling a little stretched, right? And, and also inviting them to do the same, for them, for them to take that step in the relationships and, and being able to invite them into safe spaces, safe relationships, um, and being able to say, like, let, let's look at kind of having an asset-minded um, approach, right? Like, what are your strengths, right? And then how do we cultivate that to, to really then think about flourishing, Right now, does there need to be space to process and digest and to reflect? Absolutely. I think that's part of the thing that is often lost. We power through, right? When these really rough and hard and detrimental things, that traumatic experiences happen, right? That's a society. That's our culture, right? We shove. We move forward. We maintain busyness. We, we. I mean, in a lot of ways, we like put that on a pedestal, and our kids pick up on that. But, but what does it look like when we take take intentional beats to sit, to ground ourselves and say, let me think about how I am feeling. And so part of that work, right, so if I shift from posture to kind of approach is um, something that I have been trained in is circle keeping. Um, and so, you know, you may have heard of healing circles, peace circles, um, but I am just like the biggest fan of circles because it, it's, a, it's a very intentional approach to conversation in a space with other people in community. And I think that's important to know also, we're not doing this alone. We're not in our rooms in isolated spaces. We're doing this in community with one another, but but, but we're thinking about both ourselves individually, right? And we're thinking about community because that's just reality. My identity and our communal identity, it's always going to intersect, right? My trauma and my community's trauma probably also intersect. So in that same way, my healing and my community's healing intersects. And so those spaces and that approach to check in, to process, to think about how do we hear from each other, to contribute to one another, all of that are things that we want to be thinking about and creating space for. And I think I'll pause there. <laughs> Oh, yes, I think you've been on. Oh, I'm just talking away, just talking to someone. All right, we can, we can cut out that gap. You're, you're good. Now. Okay. Uh, yeah. You're just chatting, you're chatting. There you go. Just run it back. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for the way in which you framed the work. You know, I am more than my trauma. Young people, young people, I'm sure I'm just like, I am more than just my trauma here, right? I am a young person that wants, that is flourishing, that wants to flourish, that has, there's more to me than this. And when I think about the work that, that, that you do and that your peers are doing across the board. And we think about adults who maybe haven't had um, a safe, nurturing space to process their own trauma. We, we then have adults who are trying to do this work who also have trauma that they need to, to deal with, to look at through a real clear lens and process. The work that I that I do with women specifically, we talk about it. We use the word crucible moments to identify those moments in time where the traumatic incident or whatever occurred, and that how important it is to look at it, to process it, to examine it, to learn the lessons, so that you can, you know, have reconciliation and then bring it forward those lessons so that you can change and be better tomorrow than you were today. That sort of thing, and so help us like move away, not move away from our, the, the lens of young people, but when we think about the adults that I, you know, across the country and as we're doing this work, how would you talk about the importance of processing the trauma in healthy ways, regardless of your background, right? This isn't necessarily rooted in socioeconomics and race. This is people have traumatic events and they're trying to do really good work. 
how do they do that without processing it? What would be, what were your recommendations or your thoughts around on the importance of, of doing that work? Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, Jess, that um, we've all experienced trauma, you know, and I think I was at a workshop a few years ago and um, that statement was said, and, and the, the facilitator said, listen, I'm going to say something that's really controversial. Everyone has experienced trauma. And, the, and then there was silence in the room. And, and there were lots of different people in that space. I, I don't know everyone's stories in that space, but but that statement, I think, is really powerful and important um, because I think oftentimes you, when you hear that word trauma or you hear like healing, you have a certain picture, right? And I think it's important that we we confront that, right? Like we confront that and say, okay, who are you picturing? Now let's shift that. And I want you to just see yourself and recognize that like, right? We, If nothing else, right, which I doubt that this is the only experience of trauma, but like the pandemic, COVID-19, that was a distressing and disturbing event, right? Because it was out of the norm. And that's what causes our bodies to get stiff, our minds to sh kind of like be a little berserk. Um, so when it comes to the adults, I, I <clears throat> biggest thing I'll say, two things that come to mind is I mean, I can I can just say yes, right? In terms of what you said, yes, they need there needs to be safe spaces for adults. I mean, for everyone, right? I think safe spaces are critical. Um, and I think the beauty when when I get to keep circle, the thing about circle is that there's this equity in that circle. So while I'm keeping circle, I'm just as much of an active participant. Just because I am an adult with youth does not mean I suddenly have a, there's a different power dynamic. And to me, that's the really beautiful thing about that, that space for me, because I'm processing, reflecting, and healing alongside the youth. And I think that's equally important for all adults. Um, I think this notion of recognizing that we are, we get stuck, right? Like trauma, PTSD, like whatever that, whatever degree of that means that in some ways we are stuck. And so the, the question then is how do we get unstuck, right? And that looks a lot of different ways for a lot of people. For my own personal journey in um, kind of confronting and moving through my trauma, it was it was really spending time in nature. It was um, really you know being doing some intentional trauma unraveling work in therapy. It was being intentional about finding safe spaces that I was regularly part of. Um, and and I can only you know speak from my experience. But what I will say is. What I would love to see, you know, and my hope in terms of something that for NCO that we've been talking about is how do we how do we provide circle spaces, these safe restorative spaces for the adults in our community, right? And and that is a dream of mine to be able to offer that and say, hey, this is just you know this is happening, and so show up, that. thank you, right? And we're gonna kind of I'm gonna use that actually, and and I know Rob's got a question here, but I love love love. I also love circles. And, and I find myself in them, although I don't know that we name them so explicitly. I just think that there's something to this I want to explore a little bit deeper. And they do that with you offline. I think it's, it's really remarkable. Thank you for that. Hmm. Yeah, Sonia, you, just, I really appreciate you, you ad addressing the, the holistic nature of this. There are so many different threads at work here. But I think one of the things that maybe is new for this podcast and, and the conversations we've had to date is how much you've painted the picture of how critical it is to do the self-reflection work as because we, we have our listener base if you're listening to this podcast and you're still listening it's very much a service oriented bent right we got people that want to know what does it mean to go out and live a life of justice to love their neighbor love their community that we don't need to it's like they're not a, a balloon that we need to slap up and like get them motivated. They already have that motivation. I think they're they're seeing this as, hey, I gotta I gotta be a continuous learner. And I think that what we're doing in this conversation that is new is that we're actually you mentioned mirrors earlier. We're actually holding up a mirror 
to our audience for a second in this conversation and saying, to the degree that you're going to be, you know, able to go and help others flourish, you actually have to make sure you're doing the internal work to process the pain and the trauma that is in your life that you may not have held the space for or dealt with in healthy ways. And you disregarding that to focus and help others healing is actually a contradiction in terms because you're not going to be able to really help them flourish. You said something earlier about someone's trauma being connected, intersecting with their community's trauma and therefore their healing being it. I think that's almost want to take that statement and apply it to myself as someone who's a, in the nonprofit space, been, been that, there my whole career. I think we're really, people who are in that space are really bad at this, really bad at this, really bad at, at turning inward because we're always wanting to go and help others, but I'm not really seeing how connected our healing is to their healing. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you for doing that. Um, and I guess I want to, I want to, I want to shift the conversation a little bit, or I guess maybe go into a little bit deeper waters here. You talk about on your website, you know, you, I love how you list the core values. I think everybody needs to do that. Every organization needs to say, hey, here's what we're about. Almost as a way to say, hold us accountable to say, these are the things we're about. And if you, we want you to know this so that you can see and, 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 and hold us accountable to living these things out. But one of these terms is really an interesting one. On your website, you name this this term of Sankofa. Am I, am I pronouncing that right, Sankofa? Okay. Um, it's listed first of seven, which I think implies that it's important. And so I wanted to ask you to elaborate on this because the description you offer for this term, that I, I didn't know what it meant, and I think our listeners will be new to it as well, or many of them, is it's saying that you build on the foundation of your community's history. And I'm like, I want you to speak more on that because I feel like I'm going to be like, preach, please. That is super important. I think we've been striving to do, I think, something similar here in Durham uh, with our work at Reed City. So can you just impact that, unpack that a little bit more for our listeners? What does it mean to live out that term of Sankofa and to build on the foundation of your community's history when it comes to uh, pursuing flourishing, addressing trauma, uh, and injustice? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to take a, just a quick 30 seconds to just kind of unpack the what Sankofa is, right? Um, Sankofa is, to me, just a, it, it's a metaphorical symbol, but it's also, to me, just a beautiful reminder of what it means to exist in life, right? Um, so for, for those of us who may not be as familiar, um, Sankofa is a symbol, like I said, it's used by the Akan people of Ghana, right? And so um, if, you, if, you look, if you Google this, right, you'll see kind of a picture of a bird, right? Its head is turned backward, taking its egg from its back, right? But its body is pointed forwards, right? And so that expresses the importance of reaching back to knowledge gained in the past and bringing it into the present in order to make positive progress forward, right? And so, so in that, just beautifully there, is this notion of back present, like past, present, future, just constantly rolled into one. Um, the reason why that's such an integral part of, of what we do is recognizing that work has been done and is being done. Right? Like, <clears throat> I know that there's innovation and I'm not saying, you know, and there's creativity and all that. Like, and I want to honor and recognize that, but we have to, we have to remember that there has been experiences, there has been trailblazing, and there has been work that has been done by people, you know, in the past. And particularly, I think it's important when you are intentional about a space or a community, right? And so for NCO, we have been called to really serve the greater Brownsville community in Chicago which is a historically predominantly African-American, Black American community, right? Um, so I am not Black. I don't identify as Black. I'm an Asian American woman. Um, and that has been, so for this work, but also in my work in education, where I work in predominantly African-American, Black American schools, right? It, it's so important that we 
and I can't believe still in 2021, I say this with very like much gusto because I think it's important to say like, it's important not to be colorblind, <laughs> right? Because I mean, somehow 20 years later, since when I first was in grad school for education, it's still a thing. It's still a thing that people are like confused about, right? But it's important to recognize, you know, the space that we are entering and then what it means to then learn from not just the past, but learn from people, making connections, collaborating, having partners, um, and to really understand what it means to partner and to, to move forward alongside, right? And to understand that we take a posture of lifelong learning, right? And even, even when we are um, facilitating work around restorative justice, right? That we're still learning and growing and we understand where are the spaces and places where we need to ask others for um, teaching, right? So that we can be robust and comprehensively productive and flourish, right? To do it any other way, to me, really misses the point of what it means to really think about um, full healing and um, progressing forward, answer, right, God. in, in a holistic God. manner. I love it. Wow, that was. I got. I think we got more than yeah. we bargained for. That visual yeah. of the bird. Right. Um, I oh, appreciate yeah. you get, unpacking it and giving its origins too. In the in the black community, a lot of a lot of my peers, um, we think about Sankofa around economic justice and bringing people. I mean, in in general, but but really, there's a, a lot of my peers really use that as a motivation um, around closing the wealth gap and. In, in the work that I do. So I also see it as very inspiring and I'm, re I'm grateful to see that it's one of your values. That's, that's really special. Let's talk about hope is also a value, right? Amen for hope. Sometimes we do these talks and we do these podcasts and, it, and we always sort of end on a note. It, it, it inevitably comes back to the bright side of the work because you have to be inspired by the work that you do and the the, the young people that I'm sure they give you so much like strength and, and that they provide happiness and got, I mean, it, there's just a lot there that we, we have to kind of go down into the work and then come back out through the hopefulness of why we do it. So, you know, talk to us about that. Like, why do you do this? Why do you personally find hope? Where do you personally find hope and why is hope so important in the work that you do day, day to day? Yeah, um, I really believe in the goodness of people, right? So, I, you know, earlier I talked about justice and where the systems and structures are flawed and broken and, um, you know, marginalized people. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because I'm like, I hate systems. Systems suck, right? Like systems are what is oppressing people and we need to get rid of systems. But what, as I sat in that, um, I realized everything's a system, right? Humanity is a system. That's maybe the one system that I, I really do have faith in, right? And, and that's where I draw hope. I draw hope in people's goodness. I, I do. And, and so this work, this work that we do at NCO, it's, it's, it's soul work, right? It's not money work. It's not paper work. It's, we don't really, you know, like it's, it's the work of, human interactions. And to me, that's about like souls connecting. And, and I have hope that there's goodness in people. And so that's what keeps me going in terms of like showing up at the garden, you know, establishing partnerships with schools, hosting, you know, community events, you know, providing circle, like, because I love that because there's so goodness simple. in people goodness. and oh, people yeah. deserve mm. goodness. <laughs> Humanity, humanity as a system. Hello, hello. Come on, that that is a beautiful notion, and I just think that the idea of almost seeing it as neutral, right? This idea that hey, you can you can hate on systems, but I think if you really, it, in, in a way, it it can be it can be used for evil or for good, and that's actually create ones that actually like like Joseph, like our last podcast guest, honestly, Jess, right? We're like hey. Um, we need to be able to create systems that allow for 
everybody to flourish. And so that it's not a inherently flawed concept. It's just that it has not been used for flourishing in, uh, in, in much of our history. And so we got to learn from that history, like the bird, right? Looking back while our bodies are shaped forward. Man, whew, Sonia, are you sure you're not a preacher? Because I feel like you're giving like a lot of these sticky analogies that are like, I mean, you, you're locked and loaded for like 10 sermons here. I don't, I mean, you, you're going to get Pastor David to run for his money. I'm gonna, he's going to listen to this and chuckle along the way. He knows I'm right. Uh, you've gotten our, you've taken our listeners on a journey and I want to, I want to do uh, this conversation, Justice, uh, you can't help but I just, these puns, they're, they're inescapable. I'm I, sorry, Jess. I got doing the um, head shake. It's, you know. He's just sitting there. All this is now captured on video. <laughs> See, all, all this shade that I used to get, it was buried. Now it's up on the surface and everybody knows it. Um, Sonia, thank you. This has been a powerful conversation and I want to empower our listeners with, we, we've called it historically a show up moment, you know, What's just one thing, you know, there's another pun, right? What's just one thing that our audience can do to show up uh, in their backyard? They may not, you know, they're more than likely not in your backyard. They're probably in ours, or who knows? They could be anywhere. We got a global following. There are people all, all across the world that listen to the Just Podcast, which is kind of crazy. But if you could think of a way where people can show up where they are to apply this knowledge and this, this journey of this conversation, in their community, like let's take it from the 10,000 foot down to the ground level, um, what advice would you give them or next step would you encourage them to pursue? I have a just one thing with like That's a fair. two bullet That's fair, point. you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just one thing, humanize all interactions. Mm. Humanize all interactions, but I want to caveat that and say, remember, you also interact with yourself. Yeah. I love it. And I love, I love things that are simple. Actually, I know, try to open. One bullet point. There you go. One yeah, thing, one, one caveat. When I hear point on their concise hmm. messaging, I'm just like, yes, that's it. That's it. There's so much there. Thank you. That was beautiful. Wow. Well, Sonia, I really appreciate you. Again, thank you for taking the time. Uh, on behalf of our listeners, I know that you have you planted some seeds here that I really hope we all will lean in and, and ponder on and really let let reflect on the truth that I think that you have, have led us into this conversation. So appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and, hey, before we let you go, how about bullet point? Since you kind of merged those into one, let's save the space for bullet point two. If people want to know more about your work, where can they go online to learn more about new community outreach and the work you're doing there in Bronzeville community? Yeah, absolutely. So our website, really complicated. It's newcommunityoutreach.org. That's, that's my sarcasm. <laughs> I tried. Um, so, I mean, just simply that. And then on our social, we are at new community outreach. So we're on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so yeah, and if there's any other questions, you know, we, we love to be able to share, um, about our work. So please reach out. Um, would love to have any other conversations. And again, like I said, at the start, again, just so much appreciation mm -hmm. and grateful for you both for creating this kind of space. I think without spaces like these, we can't have conversations and conversations are important so that we can be motivated, motivated and, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, like you said, it's, uh, a, it's a community effort, right? Work. It takes so a community, so and we appreciate you being a part of this this greater community that we're all we're all connected with, and for being able to thank lead you. us through this conversation. So, Sonia, it's awesome talking to you. That was. Thank you. <laughs>